get started now. So this is obviously the special session for the Lionel McKenzie Lecture. And I'm very pleased to be asked to, to, to introduce Nancy Stokey to give a brief biography. She earned her bachelor's degree at the University of Pennsylvania, went on to Harvard to do a PhD, both in economics, and then started her career in the Kellogg School at Northwestern in the Meds Department, where she rose up through the ranks and was the Harold Earl Stewart Professor before decamping to the University of Chicago, where she since has become the Frederick Henry Price Distinguished Service Professor of Economics. Nancy is a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences and a member of the National Academy of Sciences of the USA. Of her work in economics, of course, we all have our favorites. Mine include the Information Trade and Common Knowledge paper with Paul Milgram, the Durable Goods Pricing paper, and then also the uh, work on learning by doing. However, I suspect that to many people in the audience, you really first became associated with Nancy Stokey's name during your first year of graduate school when you had to study recursive methods in economic dynamics, the 1989 book by Stokey and Lucas with Prescott. And I, I'm stressing the order of the names here because so many people assume that it's alphabetical, and it is not. Uh, of course, many people in the audience, depending on how your research interests have evolved, not only used the book in graduate school, but it has stayed on your bookshelf in a treasured spot and been used repeatedly as a very useful reference piece for your own work. Um, unfortunately, I wasn't of the generation that learned the, from that book. Instead, I first met Nancy when we were both graduate students, and she was one of a small group of students that Ken Arrow brought to Stanford for several months every summer. And I think this means that I met Nancy before Bob did, just for fun. Uh, anyway, I think it's very appropriate that Nancy is giving the Lionel McKenzie lecture because you know, we, we tend to associate McKenzie, of course, with, with general equilibrium theory and definitely with his stance on doing economics rigorously and doing rigorous economics, not just in economic theory, but over a wide range of applications. And, of course, McKenzie has also done some work in dynamic economics, too. So I think it's very appropriate that Nancy was asked to give the McKinsey talk. And then also I should point out something else that people might not be so aware of, which is that Nancy has a co-author, Jerry Green, who was one of McKinsey's most famous student, PhD students. And with no further ado, I'm going to introduce Nancy Stokey from the University of Chicago. Her title is The Race Between Technology and Human Capital. Well, thank you all for coming. It's, a, it's an honor to be here giving the Lionel McKenzie lecture. Um, he was a great economist, and uh, uh, so it's a very great honor. And it's also a great pleasure to be here this year uh, to celebrate Aloysia's 70th birthday. And, you know, other people have said it, but I'm going to say it too. You know, his, his in addition to his many contributions to the science of economics, you know, he's also made so many contributions to the profession in many ways, just, you know, and I would say like in two hemispheres, um, both the northern and the southern, and, you know, through his many, many students. Um, so it's, it's wonderful to be here. Okay, so this paper is about the, the I call it the race between technology and human capital. And so really, you know, the question I'm after is, you know, what, what, is the, what is or what are the engines of sustained growth in the developed world? And so, you know, basically, is it technology? Is it human capital? Or is it the two interacting? I think, you know, by now among growth economists, there may not be much agreement about anything else, but people are broadly agreed that physical capital, you know, it tags along. It's producible, and the amount that's produced is driven by a rate of return 
but it's not the engine of anything. The relative importance of human capital and technology, you know, is, is, is much less clear. And self, you know, the growth literature, for the most part, is, you know, a little schizophrenic about, you know, which one is it. And in fact, I would say the inspiration for me, the, the, the motive to write this paper was having taught courses on economic growth for graduate students, you know, for quite a few years by now. It, it is, it's like, you know, there are a lot of papers where human capital is the engine of growth. So that goes back to Uzawa, you know, uh, some of Paul Romer's work, uh, Bob Lucas, uh, more recently Lucas and Mall and Perla and Tonetti. Um, so we can explain growth 2% per year, whatever you want, entirely through that mechanism. And then there's a whole different literature where growth is based on endogenous technical change. So this isn't just, you know, assuming, you know, some kind of augmenting technical change, but these are models where firms actively engage in R&D to develop new, te new technologies. So, you know, Romer has one, a contribution there and, and many others. And then there are, you know, there, there's more literature on growth as well, but I would say it's, it's like from my own point of view, it was trying to think about, you know, <coughs> it, you feel a little schizophrenic. You know, we can explain all of growth this way. We could, all, we could also explain it, you know, that way. You know, take your pick. So here I'm trying to put, construct a model where, you know, we could, you know, you ask what, what's going to help us, you know, pick, I guess it's empirical evidence. So we need to somehow have a framework to let bring some empirical evidence to, you know, bear light on that question. You know, and so what is, what, what are those, what kinds of evidence do we have? I would say these are some of the examples. So they're growth accounting exercises. You know, they started with Solo's uh, 57 paper. They've been done, you know, for many countries, just looking at growth over time and parsing it out between human capital, physical capital, and the solo residual. So that solo residual is technology. Uh, you can do the same thing with cross-country data. Instead of look, taking a, a one country over time, line up all the countries in the world from you know, poorest to richest, and do the same kind of exercise there. And in both those cases, you get, you know, human capital has a, a substantial effect. You know, it, has, it, it gives some bite, but there's a lot, you know, that solo residual technology is always big too. And then I've argued <coughs> in other places that if you look at developing countries, it's, uh, to me, hard to explain very rapid episodes of growth unless you say there's some technological spillovers coming in from abroad. So the extreme examples are the growth miracles, but, um, uh, you know, uh, Prescott and before him, uh, Alexander Gershenkron back in the, you know, 1960s talked about the advantages of, Gershenkron talked about the advantage of backwardness, that, you know, you don't have to reinvent all the wheels yourself. You can, and, and Prescott kind of formalized that evidence with uh, his, picture on doubling times. Okay, so the contribution of this paper is to develop a model where both human capital and technology play a role. Um, growth is going to involve investments by individuals in human capital and by firms in uh, better technologies. Uh, and, you know, the, the main contribution, the main result of the paper is to, you know, provide conditions where this setup is going to deliver a balanced growth path. On the balanced growth path, human capital and technology are going to grow at the same rate. That rate will be endogenously determined. And it's the, you know, we'll see by the end, the, the, the formula for the growth rate is, you know, it's pretty, you know, relatively transparent, I would say. So we can look at some comparative statics. And I would say more importantly, we can ask, uh, you know, does the model say one is more important than the other? And, you know, to my surprise, we'll see the model, it puts in human capital and technology in a fairly symmetric way. But at the end, it's going to be parameters governing the growth of human capital 
that really drive the, the growth in, in both human capital and technology. And if we think about the parameters on the technology side, those together with the skill parameters are going to uh, govern growth in the number of uh, products, the number of varieties. So I was a little surprised because as you see, the model is quite, it's fairly, fairly symmetric. Um, I guess, you know, uh, some people, uh, Professor Lucas for one, tells me human capital is everything and technology is just another name for a certain kind of human capital. In this, in my setup, it's going to be, they're very distinct in the sense that human capital is acquired by individuals and it's a rival, what the growth people call a rival input into production. I can use my human capital, nobody else can use it. While technology is shared by anybody, you know, in principle, anybody can use the technology. Now here, the, the, the technology is going to be uh, uh, specific to a firm, and the firm has, you know, kind of monopoly rights uh, for producing its particular product with its technology. But the, in principle, everybody could use the technology. Okay, so the roadmap for the rest of the talk is first we'll look at uh, the production and pricing setup. So this is a dynamic model. At each instant in time, the economy is going to solve a production and you know, pricing problem. It's kind of a static uh, allocation problem. Then we'll look at the dynamics. Um, and then we'll uh, focus on balanced growth paths and especially you know, look at what determines the long run growth rate in this economy. Okay, and let me say, uh, I, I welcome questions at any time. Um, this, is, this is a brand new paper. The, the big race here was the race between me and the clock, you know, trying to get the, the you know, results, and get some results. So uh, I've, I hope, I, if, if it's not, everything's not crystal clear, please feel free to, you know, ask questions. Okay, so the production setup is we're going to have a continuum of intermediate products indexed in each by their technologies. So we're going to have this technology ladder, um, and uh, so there's a you know there's going to be a distribution function, the density with a density little f, um, and capital N sub p is going to be the number of firms that are actually producing. When we get to the uh, dynamics, we'll see there, there could be, we're going to have sort of sets of firms who are investing rather than producing. So NP is the number of producers. Uh, then we're going to also have a continuum of workers indexed by their human capital and uh, with a density G and LW is the number of workers. So these are people who are actually engaged in production and not investing. So. So we have a, a, a technology ladder and a skill ladder, and the uh, you know the the kind of uh, the uh, static equilibrium is going to like match skills to technologies. Okay, so a firm with so what's the technology for output? I've got it here in my laser. A firm that has technology level X. If it employs, employs this number of workers, each with human capital H, the output Y is it's, it's linear in the number of workers, and the output per worker depends on H and X. And this function phi is a CES function with an elasticity less than one. So. Uh, this means that this function is log supermodular. So in, in a loose sense, technology and skill are complements. And the equilibrium in the labor allocation, that market is competitive. So equilibrium is going to deliver a positive, you know, assortative matching between technologies and skill levels. Okay, then as is common in the growth literature, we want to think about one final output, so I'll call that YF, 
And that's produced using these intermediates in a constant returns to scale technology. And it's also going to be CES with an elasticity rho. And we need rho greater than one. And that's just because these firms are monopolistic competitors. Uh, we need rho greater than one to get a solution to the monopolistic competition model. Uh, and then this parameter new, we're going to have this, this should be n sub p. This is the kind of returns to having more products. So f is, you know, a, a density function, and then we want to scale by the number of products. Uh, but we, we, it might not, output might not be, you know, just sort of linear in the number of products. So uh, rho nu is going to measure decreasing returns to a uh, variety. And in this setup, just, so, you know, as you probably all know, like, for each firm, uh, the optimal uh, kind of price setting rule is just to mark up their price, set their price as a, you know, a fixed markup over unit cost. Okay, so that just comes from the demand from the final good producers. Okay. Okay, so, all right, so at each instant in time, we have uh, this, you know, continuum of workers. They just supply their one unit of uh, labor inelastically with whatever human capital they have. Uh, firms uh, look at the wage function, choose what kind of workers to hire. They want to minimize unit cost and then how many workers to hire. That's going to be driven by demand from the final goods sector. So this production equilibrium is going to consist of a wage function and then functions describing the allocation of skill to different types of firms, the number of workers at each firm, price for each type of firm, output level, and profits, um, and output of the final good. Okay, so that's all at each instant. Um, yeah, so final goods firms are choosing inputs to minimize cost, uh, intermediate producers are choosing the type of type of worker to minimize cost, and everything in this part, everything in the production equilibrium, in, in the end, is efficient. Firms are earning profits, but uh, the, the the allocation is efficient. Uh, okay, so. So a production equilibrium is described by all the parameters, the number of the number of producing firms, the number of you know workers, people actually engaged in work, and the two distribution functions. And it's pretty it's pretty straightforward to show you know there's a solution and it's unique and it's efficient. So and and we have this positively assorted of matching. Now for the growth part of the model, what's uh, going to be important is some homogeneity properties. So the first one is this. There's a growth model. Now on a balanced growth, so I have a distribution of skill, a distribution of technologies. On a balanced growth path, both, both of those dis, uh, distributions are, you know, marching upward at a common <coughs> constant rate. So I want to know what happens to this, uh, you know, production equilibrium when, as we shift the distribution functions. And it's pretty, oops, pretty straightforward to show that um, prices and employment are unchanged for each firm. Uh, it, its labor quality is just scaled up by the same way its, its technology is scaled up. And output and profits are also scaled up because of the uh, homogeneity of degree one of the production function. Wages and final output are also scaled up. And let me say, prices and wages are always denominated in units of the final good. So the, the price of the final good is normalized to one everywhere. Okay, and then the second lemma has to do with changes. I want to allow pop population growth, potentially, and I want to allow entry of new firms. So increasing the number of workers, what happens? Um, 
employment output and profits <coughs> at every firm are just scaled up by the growth in population. Uh, prices and wages are unchanged. If I increase the number of firms without changing the distribution function for technology, um, uh, what happens? Well, the allocation, uh, this function H star is unchanged, so we still get the same relationship between human capital and technology, but you know, each uh, firm is going to have to uh, employ fewer workers, so employment per firm is scaled down. Um, uh, wages, prices, and final output are all scaled by uh, this factor omega. Uh, and profits at each firm could rise or fall depending on omega. And omega has to do with how much this, uh, you know, uh, the benefits of variety kick in. So increasing the number of firms has a little bit different effects because if you have more firms, you just have to spread the workers thinner and profits, you know, go down at each firm. Okay, now this is really the key to the tractability of this model. And I was, you know, I was very happy when I discovered this fact that if both of these distribution functions are Pareto, then the, this, what I call a production equilibrium, has a very particular simple form. Um, I get, they're both Pareto and they have to be, you know, aligned in a certain way. So, you know, a Pareto has a lower threshold, the two lower thresholds have to be uh, uh, having the, the right ratio. Um, okay, so we're going to make F have parameters, alpha is the shape parameter, XM is the lower threshold, G has parameters gamma and HM. Uh, I want gamma and alpha both to be greater than one, so that's what you need for a Pareto to have a finite mean. And I need this elasticity E to be between zero and one. So this elasticity, you know, involves the difference between alpha and gamma. So the two Paredos don't have to be exactly the same shape, but they can't be too different from each other. So if we look at the difference between alpha and gamma, you know, there could be a wedge. Zero is okay, but there could be a wedge, but the wedge can't be too big in either direction. Okay, so this elasticity uh, we're going to see again later. So that thing has to be between zero and one. And this ratio between the two lower thresholds of the two Paredos has to be a certain constant. That constant depends on eta, and it depends on the weight parameters and the elasticity of the, that production function phi. Okay, so if all that stuff holds, then uh, the production equilibrium uh, has constant elasticity, you know, functions. The wage is a constant elasticity function with, you know, elasticity one minus eta, uh, epsilon. Uh, the allocation of uh, skill to technology is linear with uh, uh, this coefficient AH. And then the price, output, uh, employment, and profit functions are also isoelastic, you know, and they have, they each have their own elasticity on X. And the one that's going to be key for dynamics is the profit function. So that elasticity is one minus zeta, where one minus zeta is, you know, uh, just defined in terms of epsilon. So wages have elasticity one minus epsilon, profits one minus zeta. Okay, and you know, why was I happy to get these constant elasticity functions? It's just when you, all right, we're going to turn next and look at the dynamics. Without constant elasticity functions, the di dynamics become just kind of, I would say, hopeless, at least very difficult. Okay. Questions? 
Okay, so now the, for most of the rest, uh, I'm going to specialize to the case of Pareto distributions. And then the investment mechanism I'm going to use is just adopted from uh, a recent paper by Perla and Tonetti. And, you know, why do I like their investment function? It's very simple. So investment is just going to be a zero one decision. Uh, firms can, you know, they have a, a one factor model. They, they, they call it technology. I would actually call it more, something more like human capital. So they have these agents. Each agent has his X. And you can produce and get output X. Or you can take one period off from production, pay that opportunity cost, and get a new draw that's drawn from the set of current producers. So that's the investment decision. It's just the only cost is an opportunity cost, and the, the, uh, the outcome is you get a new draw. OK, so this is just taken from their paper. So they're, you know, they're, they have one factor, and it's in discrete time. And so it's just if you start with uh, this Pareto in period T, there's going to be a set of uh, agents. And you know, who wants to pay the opportunity cost? It's the guys at the bottom of the distribution. Like everybody who invests is drawing from the same pool. So the guys with the lowest opportunity cost are the guys at the bottom. So this dynamics is just going to always chop off the bottom of the Pareto distribution and, and shift it outwards. OK. So, so that's it. So I'm going to have that kind of investment on both sides. OK. So, but I'm going to add a few more bells and whistles as well. So uh, my, my model is going to be in continuous time. So agents who want to start investing are always going to be the guys at the bottom. And if we look, say, at, at you know, firms, there's going to be a set capital NP of firms that are actually producing. And then another set, I'm going to call it N sub I. And they're going to be like a pool of investors. So any firm can, and it's going to be the firms at the bottom of the distribution that choose to do this, they can jump out of the set of producers into the set of investors. And then those, those guys are all identical. They've given up their old technology. And then there's going to be a constant hazard rate for uh, you know, getting your new draw. So I'm going to have a pool, and the hazard rate is going to just governs how fast you re-enter the set of producers. Um, it's just in, in continuous time, I have to keep them, you know, out of the market for a little while, and that's just a convenient way to do it. Um, okay, so what's going to happen on a balanced growth path? Um, the distribution functions for uh, technology and human capital are going to shift to the right at a common rate G. That's what we want to determine. Uh, population is going to grow at a constant rate uh, new, that, no, what is that thing, new, whatever, uh, but, and that's exogenous. The number of firms is going to grow at a constant rate, and that's going to be endogenously determined by a free entry condition. And so on a balanced growth path, total output grows because of growth in technology and skill, population growth and growth in the number of firms. Uh, per capita consumption grows only because of G and N. And profits per firm grow because of G and population growth. And the effect of N depends on omega. Could in that, uh, so this term could be positive or negative. OK, so that's just the kind of overview. So now to think about the dynamics, I want to look at Bellman equations. We have producing firms. They're going to you know, have a value that depends on their current technology. And you know, we could say the distribution of all the technologies. Uh, in the end, it's uh, uh, you know, 
on a balanced growth path, it's just going to be their relative position. So they're going to have a Bellman equation. <coughs> the firms that are investing have a Bellman equation because the pool that they're drawing from is shifting over time. So the value of an investor is growing at a certain rate. Then, I mean, on the worker side, those two things are going to be just, you know, symmetric. Uh, that, you know, they, the workers abandon their current skill and wait to acquire a new one. Um, so there's going to be value functions for workers who are actually engaged in production and investors. And then the what, one, and I'm going to put the population growth, they're going, I'm going to give them the same investment technology as, you know, incumbent workers who decide to start investing. There's like, it seems harmless since the growth rate of population is anyway fixed. On the firm side, I want endogenous entry. So I'm going to have a little bit different tech, you know, the entrants are going to have a little bit different uh, uh, investment technology so that I can get entry from a, uh, the level of entry from a, you know, just a free entry condition. Okay, so uh, all firms of all types die at a fixed rate delta, delta X. A producer, an incumbent producer, has a, I'm going to let him, t his technology grow at a constant rate mu x. We could set that equal to zero. Um, but it, 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 we'll just put it in. All right. And as I said, he can at any time abandon his current technology and acquire a new one. And like, if, you know, you might think about this as process innovation. They're just getting a better technology for producing the old product. And the only, the cost is the opportunity cost. Okay, and success, once a firm is in this pool of investors, success has a, uh, you know, a, a constant uh, arrival rate lambda x. And conditional on success, they get a technology that's a random draw from the set of incumbents. And so the, the, uh, you know, for me, the, you know, I have to think that the, the, the issue is to uh, figure out what the, what the appropriate threshold is for, you know, investing firms. Who wants to invest? Okay, so we're going to have a value function, you know, it, I'm going to, I'm going to go through this with, you know, the T's in the value functions. Just, uh, for, and, then, uh, and then we'll look at the, the normalized form, what they're going to look like on a balanced growth path. So at day T, the value of an incumbent producer with current technology X, and this is going to be the value of an investing firm. Um, they're going to, you know, they're going to evolve over time. So the Bellman equation for an investor, it's his, what's, his, his uh, R is the interest rate, and then there's uh, exit at this fixed rate delta. So uh, his, this is like the, uh, you know, kind of the appropriate flow return has to be equal to lambda is his, uh, uh, the success rate. If he succeeds, what he gets is the difference between the expected value of incumbents and his current thing, and then there may be some growth just because, you know, the whole economy is growing. So that's the Bellman equation for an investor. <coughs> he has no decision, so this is just, you know, that's what it is. It's a, you know, a differential equation. Uh, the Bellman equation for a producer, well, as long as he's actually producing, you know, he doesn't have any other decisions to make. His, this profit function is what it is. That's already profits are maximized. So his, you know, the appropriate, uh, you know, rate of return for him, it's coming from his profit flow, plus he's getting growth at the rate mu x, plus he's getting some growth because the whole economy is growing. Now, I also have to think about the, uh, the you know, the optimal choice of, you know, who's invest, who's, who's, for whom does this Bellman equation apply? And what's the lower bound? Where does, you know, who chooses to invest? 
And if you look at that problem, you see that you know, there, there's, there are going to be two conditions. So these value functions have to match up at the lower threshold. The levels and the derivatives have to match up. So, um, so that gives me uh, the, the value matching and smooth pasting give me this at, at the lower level. This equation has to hold. The, right at the threshold, the firm is indifferent between producing or investing. And uh, you know, since all investors are the same, that's the derivative. OK, so now those equations are a little messy, but now with, on a, with Pareto distributions, so we have these constant elasticity profit functions. Um, uh, these things take a much simpler form. Oops. Um, all right, so the, the, we're going to need that the growth rate for, the, for technology in the economy is, is, is bigger than mu x. Why is that? Because we need, otherwise, firms would never be, uh, you know, producers would never be stopping production in order to invest. And, and we, need, we need to have them dropping out. So this is a restriction on, you know, the, the final balance growth path. And if I take those two Bellman equations we had on the previous page, they just, they have a normalized form. And notice here the, the isoelastic profit function comes in. And so we have this, uh, you know, this uh, ordinary differential equation, which is going to have a very nice solution. And uh, this is the, uh, the um, this is the Bellman equation for the investors. Okay, so this differential equation is going to have one root, and it's negative. Okay, so if I think now about solving, you know, what do these normalized solutions look like? Um, the normalized distribution function just, you know, I normalized by setting uh, the average x equal to unity. And so that tells me what the lower threshold is for the normalized thing. And then uh, the smooth pasting condition, I mean, if you think about the economics, that determines XM as a function of this value of being an investor. Sort of the mathematics of solving the model say, uh, given XM, this equation lets me back out this value. And then if I look at the value matching condition, you know, first I'm very nervous because I think I've already got XM, I've already got this value of an investor. When am I going to get out of here? And the answer is that this thing factors out of the value matching condition, and I just get one equation that involves G and N. Okay, so, so that's that. Okay, so what about entrance? Uh, I'm going to just look at the normalized decision here. So an entrance is going to choose his hazard rate for success. And while he's investing, he has to pay a real cost to, uh, you know, for the R&D. And the cost is a strictly convex function of his hazard rate. You know, and it's zero at zero. So what's, what's the Bellman equation for an entrant? He has an active decision. He has to choose this hazard rate. If he succeeds, uh, you know, he gets the difference between, you know, the expected value of a draw and his current value, and he has to pay this flow cost. And he has to govern, he has to uh, uh, offset, you know, interest, depreciation, and this, you know, the, the fact, this compensates for the fact that the whole economy is growing. And we just, and we get a first order condition for the uh, hazard rate. Okay, so we can, we, can, we can go fast here. Like, as I said, in, for individuals, you know, the, the, it's just a, a, very, a symmetric problem to the incumbent firms. Um, so they have a, there's an exit rate, there's a population growth rate, which here is just fixed. There's a growth rate for skill, 
and there's a hazard rate for success. And new entrants to the workforce, you know, I'm going to have a, a, a population of workers and a population of investors, and new entrants just go into the population of investors. Okay, and again, to get active investment by workers, growth in the economy as a whole can't be too large relative, has to be greater than the, you know, the growth you get by remaining a producer. Um, and so for these guys, we just get uh, you know, normalized equations that are uh, very similar to the ones we had for firms. So we have the value of a worker with relative human capital H. It depends on, you know, this is his current wage. And uh, then he gets some, potentially some relative growth. For him, it's going to be shrinkage. It's going to be, he's not keeping, he, he can't be keeping up. He can have some growth, but he can't be keeping up with the change in the population as a whole. And the value of an investing worker is, you know, uh, he, they don't pay any direct costs, so it's just, you know, the, uh, this is the hazard rate for success and the payoff from getting a successful draw. All right, and we're going to, and I'm, this, RH is going to be the root for this differential equation, and that's negative. So they say, you know, it's, it's really the, 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 the thing that makes the model tractable is the fact that this, this wage function has an isoelastic form and the profit function also has an isoelastic form. Okay, so again, so on a balanced growth path, you know, XM was, the XM for the normalized distribution was just determined by the normalization. The lower bound for the, uh, the skill distribution, we have this constant A. Now, that's just a known function of parameters, so that's nailed down. Oops. And then the smooth pasting condition lets me back out the value of an investing individual. And if I look at the value matching condition, again, this thing factors out, and I get one equation in G and N. Okay, so now in terms of like uh, solving for the growth rate along this balanced growth path, I have two <coughs> equations in G and N. And so, you know, the fr I can start by just like looking at those two equations and trying to say something about the, the growth rates. Okay, but before we get there, um, all right, so we're going to have entry of new firms. Well, that just, you know, entering firms, the free entry condition says they're all indifferent they, between entering and not entering, so any number can be entering. Now, the other uh, things we have to worry about is along the balanced growth path, we have this, on the firm side, we have a, a set of producers, a set of firms that had been incumbents who are now are investing, and a set of entrants who are investing. And we have flows. They're all exiting at the rate delta. Entrants are coming in at this rate E0. And then we have flows between them. So the, we have flows from the producers to the investors that are governed by how fast the distribution is shifting and people are, you know, firms are dropping off the bottom threshold. We have uh, successful innovators moving from the two investment pools into the set of producers. And on a balanced growth path, you know, the number, the total number of firms can be growing, but the, the, the ratios between these pools have to be the same. So the population has to be, uh, you know, allocated in the same fractions across these three groups. So these, uh, the laws of motion for these three pools pin down the ratio. It's, I'm going to just talk about the, look at the ratio of investing incumbents to producers and the ratio of entrants to producers. And, you know, they just have to be something. So 
th those are those are fixed, you know, by the balanced growth path conditions. And then, you know, I have to make sure I have to look at the uh, the distribution of uh, technologies across producers. You know, so uh, firms are dropping off the bottom. They're exiting at the rate delta, and then they're entering everywhere above the bottom. And I just have to make sure that the, the kind of the law of, oops, the, the appropriate law of motion for the distribution function holds. And if you just check that, um, it does. So it's just for Pareto, it's pretty easy to check that that holds. Uh, and for firms, Again, so we get, there's uh, the, the number, the total size of the population can grow, but the ratio of investors to workers has to be constant. And we have to check that the law of motion for the distribution function is holding appropriately. And again, for a Pareto, it's, everything's lining up. Okay, so the last piece is our, uh, we're gonna have households. So we're just gonna do the usual thing, which is just organize all of these heterogeneous workers into you know, a big family. So we're gonna have a continuum of households. They're all uh, uh, identical, and each one has a cross-section of the total population. The income of this family is gonna be the, uh, wage income from all of their members. They're gonna have profit income from the firms that they own. And then they have to divide that income between consumption and investment to finance entry. So um, the optimal investment decisions are already built in. So the, uh, and I'm going to give the household groups these. Uh, kind of standard. Constant elasticity preferences. Uh, R hat is the rate of time preference. So. Uh, per capita consumption is growing at the rate GC on a balanced growth path, so I get the interest rate as the time preference plus this should be theta, theta times GC. Um, and then market clearing is going to determine the initial level, level of consumption. And the other thing we have to worry about is aggregate income is growing at this rate GY. And so I need the interest rate to be bigger than the growth rate of aggregate income. Okay, so the main result for the paper is this. For if we have initial distributions that are Pareto, the shape parameters have, you know, they have finite means and they satisfy this one additional restriction. Um, the initial location parameters have to satisfy a restriction. And the initial masses of firm types have to satisfy, you know, those restrictions. Then the, this economy has a, com has a competitive equilibrium, which is a balanced growth path, you know, from date zero. Okay. So, uh, I guess, you know, I was, I was kind of pleased that at least this setup is allowing, it's allowing distribution functions which are not, they aren't totally locked together. The Pareto's have, uh, they can have different shapes, as I said, not too different, but they could be somewhat different. And, you know, the, if you think about the location parameters, that's something that if you, you know, delved into transition dynamics, those thresholds, you know, can kind of adjust to line themselves up if they don't start aligned. Um, you know, notice that investment in this model is certainly inefficient. Why is that? It's because investment by any firm or any worker, you know, improves the whole pool of types. He's jumping off the bottom and getting a draw that's above that. 
and, and his choice, his willingness to pay this opportunity cost of investing is going to give a positive external effect for later investors. So the investment side is certainly, there's certainly too little uh, investment. Okay, and then, so what, what about these uh, two equations that determine the growth rate of, you know, of skill and technology and the growth in the number of firms? Um, okay, so we have this pair of equations and I've substituted, you know, to get everything in terms of primitive parameters. So the first one came from the, the, the firm side, the second one from the, the worker's side. And um, what I'm going to focus on right now is you see that this second equation, uh, there are two special cases where this term involving n just drops out completely. So one is for log utility, and the other is the kind of the limiting case where variety is not valued at all. So in that case, this guy drops out, this equation determines g, and then given g, this, the first equation determines n. So that's, let me say, this is the sense in which, to me, it's the stuff on the, and look what's, <laughs> you know, what's in this equation, the second equation. These are just things governing the accumulation of human capital. So this is the sense in which, uh, you know, G seems to be more governed by these uh, human capital parameters. And we'll see the growth rate of N is going to involve both parameters in a more kind of symmetric way. Okay, so for log utility, that's G. So notice that it just, uh, with G greater than mu H is just going to require this term in brackets has to be positive. So it's like the success rate has to be big enough, you know, compared with this thing. Okay, so supposing that that holds, increasing mu H increases G one for one. Uh, Increasing the hazard rate increases G. Higher, a uh, faster, you know, a higher success rate encourages investment. Uh, it's decreasing in the exit rate. Faster exit is going to discourage investment. Uh, it's decreasing in R hat. A higher discount rate discourages investment. Um, and it's decreasing in this tail param this uh, shape parameter gamma. Now remember, a higher gamma for a Pareto means a thinner tail. So, you know, there's less uh, great stuff out there to uh, draw from. So that is going to decrease uh, the growth rate. And it's increasing in 1 minus epsilon. So that's the elasticity of wages with respect to human capital. So the flatter, the closer that function is to linear, that's going to encourage. Now, and one minus epsilon depends on rho and, and this difference. Okay, so things kind of have the, you know, the comparative statics look for the growth rate, kind of grow in what seem like sensible directions. Um, and then given the, uh, oops, given Given G, the first equation determines the growth in the number of varieties. And here I'm going to specialize to the case where these two things have the same shape parameter. That's just that otherwise the equation is extremely messy. And the thing I want to emphasize, all right, so uh, is, is, is just then, it's just these differences, the difference between lambda x and, and lambda h, the difference between delta x, delta h, the difference here. So, um, if these shape parameters are, are not the same, it's still differences, but the two components have different weights. So, um, okay, so if, if technology for firms is growing faster, that's going to bump up the, the entry rate. Um, faster success rate uh, is going to bump up the entry rate, and uh, faster exit is going to push it down. Okay, so I say if alpha is not equal to gamma, it's, it's kind of similar but with much more complicated weights. Okay, and then for uh, the case where omega is equal to zero, uh, you know, the, that 
uh, one term still drops out, but now theta is in there, and we can like get a comparative static for the growth rate, uh, uh, how it's affected by theta. So notice it's decreasing in theta. So uh, a higher theta means a lower inner temporal elasticity of substitution, that a lower elasticity discourages growth. So that comparative static too goes kind of the same way. <coughs> okay, so I'm right about on time and I'm at my conclusion slide. So, you know, what's my conclusion? My first is just like, to my mind, it's like I don't want to think about a race between these two. It's like they, it, it, they have to, it's like a pair of horses, you know, in a team. They have to pull together. And, you know, if they get too far, one gets too far ahead, you know, he's going to like pause and wait for his companion to catch up. So they work together. Um, and this setup, I hope it will be useful for asking more questions. So. I mean, an obvious one is, you know, what would transition dynamics look like if, you know, if one distribution, if they don't start out perfectly aligned? Um, and then as I start, what, what kinds of empirical evidence would be useful for thinking about, uh, you know, uh, just you know, pinning down these parameters? And uh, if, as I said, investment's inefficient, what kind of policies uh, would be useful for making it more efficient? Okay, that's it. Thank you. Thank you very much. We have